5. Verses 7 through 12. It's 7 through 9 tonight, but this section is 7 through 12. And we recently, in the first part of this chapter, have talked about James is scolding, if you will, of the rich men in his congregation and the way they gain their wealth and use their wealth. And the results of using their wealth the way they did. And now I'm going to talk about patience, the power of patience. Preacher, you're picking on me. You got to my wallet and now you're talking about my patience? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's something we need to develop in our life. Is patience. Patience is a virtue. I've heard said. So why patience is something we need to develop in our life. James chapter 5 and verse 7. The Bible tells us there. Be patient therefore brethren. Unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Father, we thank you for your word and pray, Lord, tonight that you will work and bless. Father, we just ask and we pray this now in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake, amen. Amen. James wrote here, as James wrote here in verse number 7, be patient. He was still addressing the suffering saints of the 12 tribes that were scattered abroad. That was mentioned in James chapter 1 and verse 1, his audience that he wrote this letter to. In James chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, James gives this counsel of being patient to us. And at the closing of this letter, he returns back to the subject to be patient. Because God isn't going to make, we need to be patient because God is not going to make all the wrongs right in this world until the Lord comes. When the Lord comes, all the wrongs in the world will be made right. Until then, we just kind of have to suffer through. Kind of like the cowboys had to do this afternoon. We need to be able to do that as well until the Lord comes. Because God isn't going to make everything, make all the wrongs right until the Lord comes again. And uh, believers must patiently endure and expect that that will be the case. Three different times James reminds us of the Lord's coming in here in verses 7 through 9. That be patient, my brethren, unto the coming of the Lord in verse 7. Be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh in verse 8. And grudge not one another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door, ready to enter the courtroom. And he is. He is ready. He's waiting for the signal for his coming. This is our blessed hope, the coming of the Lord as Christians, as believers in Christ, according to Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. We're looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we don't expect to have everything comfortable or easy in this life. At least we shouldn't. I know there are some younger generations who kind of think everything should be comfortable. Life should be handed to them on a plate. They're going to start in the business world and they're going to start as CEO. Right out of college, straight to CEO. We'll just cut out all the middle management and stuff. You know, we won't climb the ladder. We'll forget about the ladder. We'll throw it away. I'll just start at the top. Because everything's a breeze. No, everything's not a breeze. You and I know that. Life is tough. And can be very difficult. 
And we don't expect to have everything comfortable and easy in this life. Because we don't. My father and my mother taught me the sooner that you know life is unfair, the better off your life will be. Why is that? Because I said so. <laughs> you know how the arguments, how those arguments stop. Those arguments stop right there. Mom says, because I said so. Okay. That's how it works. In fact, the Bible says in, in John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus, Jesus told us there, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Not you might have tribulation. If you have tribulation, ye shall have tribulation. Troubles come. You're either, you're either just about to go into a troubling time, you're in a troubling time, or you just got out of a troubling time in your life. That cycle goes throughout your life. Paul exhorted his new converts in, in, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 and verse number 22. <coughs> it's the end of the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, and they are returning back home through the cities and towns that they had preached the gospel and established churches in. And here in verse number 22, he says, it says they're confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. We won't get our heavenly rest until we've gone through tribulation in this earth and in this life. Satan's good at giving us tribulation and throwing it in our way. But we must endure it as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must endure the pain and hardships and heartaches of this life until Jesus comes again and takes us out of this world of heartache and pain and suffering. James used two different words, two different Greek words for the word patience in verses 7 and 8, and also again in verse 10 there in James chapter 5. And it was the word long-tempered. The words endure and patience there in, in verse number 11 that we will get to in the next couple weeks or so. Um, they literally mean to remain under, to speak of enduring, speak of endurance under great stress and strain. The word patience means to stay put and stand fast when you'd like to run away. And that's what we need to do as believers in Christ. Stand fast. When you feel like running. Greek scholars believe that long suffering, which is related to patience, refers to patience and respect to people. And I believe that's true. Because the Bible says the, that, that the Lord is long suffering to us, we're referring to people. And that endurance has to do with patience with respect to conditions or situations in life. That we go through. We must endure. Through different circumstances and situations. But the question that we need to answer is this. How can we as believers in Christ experience the kind of patient endurance as we wait for the Lord's return? How can we learn to be patient? And endure until the Lord returns in this life. Well, James gives us in verses 7 through 12 three pictures and three examples of patience. And the first one that we're going to look at tonight is that of the farmer, which many of you may be familiar with here in Kansas. To help us answer this question and to encourage our hearts. 
In verses 7 through 9 in our text tonight, we read about the farmer. See, if a person is impatient, then they should not become a farmer. Any farmer knows that no crop appears overnight. You don't plant the seed at nine and harvest the crop at five. It just doesn't happen. Even this city boy understands that having grown some things myself in my life. In fact, I look fondly back in second grade, for example. We had a garden at our school. We grew corn, we grew tomatoes, we grew carrots, and we grew all of those types of vegetables there in our garden, back in the back corner of the playground, there at school. So we learned... You plant the seed, you've got to wait. Also grew radishes and beets and carrots and watermelon and things like that at home with mom. And the thing that I remember and I liked the best is when I could take a carrot and I could pull it right out of the ground and I could rinse it off underneath the faucet and chomp right into it. That's good eating. So I got to be able to understand that crop doesn't come overnight. And the only crop that comes overnight usually is weeds. And also the farmer has no control over the weather. Too much rain, the crop will rot. Too much sun, the crop will burn up. Early frost can kill the crop. How long-suffering the farmer has to be about the weather. And how patient he has to be concerning it. The farmer also, the farmer also has to have patience with the seed and the crop. Because it takes time to plant and grow. The Jewish farmers in James's day, and probably still today, would plow and sow their fields in the fall of the year. We usually harvest in the fall of the year. There, they plant in the fall of the year. The early rain would soften the soil, and the latter rain would come in the early spring. February and March to those in Israel. Still not spring yet here in Kansas, but there it becomes spring. And it helps to make the crop mature. The farmer would have to wait many months for the seed to bring forth fruit. And why is the farmer willing to wait so long for fruit? For the crop to come. What does James tell us there? In, James tells us there in verse number 7. It says, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. Notice he calls the fruit precious. What does a farmer live by? How does the farmer make their money? By the crop usually, right? By that corn, that wheat, whatever that crop is. Those watermelon, those pumpkins, those cantaloupes, whatever the crop is. They live by that crop. That's how they make their living. So it's precious to them. It's how they gain their wealth, if you will. Good, honest work. The harvest is worth waiting for in our life too. In Galatians, in, in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, the Bible says there, And be not weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap, if ye faint not. Jesus 
Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Would you turn there with me in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. And verses 28 and 29. Mark chapter 4 and verse 28. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. And when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. James here in our text, he paints for us the picture of the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as a spiritual farmer. Looking for a spiritual harvest. That's why the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, to be not weary and well doing. In due season we shall reap. If we faint not, if we don't quit. There we see in verse number 8, be, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Our hearts are the soil. And the seed is the word of God. You remember, you remember when Christ said, when Christ told the parable of the sower. The gospel of Luke chapter 8. And verse number 11. In verses 5 through 8, Christ tells the parable here of the sower, or the parable of the soils, and he gives the interpretation of it in verse number 10, down through. To about verse 19. And he says there in verse number one, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, and, though, and, those, and those by the wayside are they which hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The types of soil, the hard soil, the wayside, the stony ground, where the person receives the word of God, but through persecution and tribulation, gives up. It has no root, so it dies. The thorny ground, you know, those weeds, that crop that you grow overnight, especially in the summer. And the good ground, the ground that brings forth fruit. And our hearts are the soil. Men's hearts are the soil. The seed is the word of God that is planted on the soil. And there are seasons in the there are seasons to the spiritual life just like there are seasons for the soil. There are times when our hearts become cold and wintry. And the Lord has to and the Lord has to do what is told to us in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 4, and verse number 3. Jeremiah 4 and verse number 3, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among the thorns. There are times in our life when the Lord has to break up our fallow ground. The fallow ground of our hearts. 
that have become hard and cold. Disillusioned, discouraged, disappointed with the things of life. And so that ground must be broken up in our hearts and lives. So the seeds of God's word can get in to encourage the heart of the believer to keep them moving forward and continuing in their faith and ministry. The Lord sends the sunshine and the rain of goodness to nurture and to water the seed that is planted. But we must be patient for the harvest. The harvest in our life. You know, witnessing and soul winning is a very discouraging business. Sometimes it's like farming. In a lot of ways it's like farming. Because you will witness to someone, you'll tell them about the gospel, you'll tell them about Jesus Christ, and you'll want them to make a decision right there and then to trust Christ as their personal Savior. And they say, no. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it right now. They're like King... Felix or Festus. When the Apostle Paul went to them and said, will you come back in a more convenient season? Convenient for who? Convenient for them? It's a very discouraging business. And you can get discouraged doing it. And your heart can become hardened because of so many people telling you, no, I don't want to trust Christ. No, not right now. No, some other time. Kicking the can down the road of their eternal soul. And sometimes for us to continue as believers in Christ, God's got to break up that ground so that we can continue to witness. We continue to put ourselves out there. Continue to tell people of Christ and His great love for them. Instead of getting discouraged and saying, I've had enough of this. I'm not going to tell anyone about Jesus again. And yes, there are believers that do that. We have to be patient for the harvest of souls. And we have to be patient for the harvest of fruit in our life. So here we have the secret of endurance when we go through tough times because God is producing a harvest in our lives he wants to cultivate in our hearts and in our lives the fruit of the spirit he wants them to grow now the Bible lists those fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23 for the fruit of the spirit is love Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And God wants us to develop that fruit in our life and have that fruit grow in our life. And the only way the Lord can do this is through troubles and trials. How do we learn patience? By going through trouble. How do we learn patience? By going through the trials of life. It's how we develop all of the fruit of the Spirit in our life. It's going through the troubles and trials. Going through the difficulties. That the Lord may grow those things in our life. And sometimes we grow impatient with God. So instead of growing impatient with God and with ourselves, how many times have you beaten up yourself because you've slipped? I do it often. My wife will tell you I'm my own worst critic. 
I'm a tough one on myself. Not the healthiest thing in the world. But I am trying to get better at it. Not being so hard on myself. But when we go through impatience with God and with ourselves, we have to be able to yield to the Lord, give ourselves to the Lord, and allow the Lord to grow this fruit in our life. We are spiritual farmers looking for a harvest. And the only way you can enjoy this kind of harvest is if your heart is established. In our text there, in, in verse number 8, Paul or, or James tells the folks, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts. See, one of the purposes of the ministry of the local New Testament church is to be able to establish the heart of the believer in the faith. In the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 11, Romans chapter 1 and verse 11 is the Apostle Paul is writing here to the church at Rome. In Romans 1 and verse 11, the Bible tells us there, for I, long, for I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established, rooted, grounded in faith. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 3. First Thessalonians, chapter 3. There in verse 1. Paul sent his son in the faith, Timothy, to Thessalonica to establish the young believers in the faith. There in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 3, and verse 1. Wherefore, when ye could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow, fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For there yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. We also see that the Apostle Paul prayed that these believers in Christ at Thessalonica would be established in the faith. Go on down a few verses there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as you do, even as we do toward you, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The ministry of God's word and prayer is important if the heart is going to be established in the faith. A heart that is not established is a heart that cannot bear fruit for the Lord. A heart that is not established cannot bear fruit. This is why many churches are, fr are fruitless. Because the hearts of their people are not established. Rooted and grounded in the word of God and in the things of God. That's why churches are carnal. 
That's why churches are compromising. That's why churches are failing. Because they're not established. And why churches become weak? Because their hearts are not established in the Word of God and the things of God. And why are they not established in the Word of God and the things of God? Because they're not here. Why is the younger generation not established in the Word of God? They're not here. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If we want to increase our faith, we've got to hear the Word of God being preached and taught. And the place that you hear the Word of God being preached and taught is in the house of the Lord. And in most churches, I hope in this church, if not, I'm wasting my time. Or I've got to change something. We need to remember that the, we need to remember that the farmer doesn't stand around doing nothing while he's waiting for the crop to grow. He's working. He's getting things ready for the harvest. He's making sure his crop is growing okay. He's got more work to do than he can handle, probably, most of the time. And those of you who grew up on a farm and know about farming, you understand that. There was more work to be done in a day, most likely. But the work got done, somehow, some way. You didn't do a lot of standing around. Wasn't a lot of time for TV. You know, there wasn't a lot of time. There wasn't video time for video games. From the time the sun came up to the time the sun came down, it was work time. And sometimes even after the sun went down. The farmer is constantly working as he looks toward the harvest. James didn't tell these suffering servants to don their white robes and go up to the hillside and wait for Jesus to come. He told them, plant the seed, keep working. Wait for the harvest, but keep working. He encouraged them to keep working and to keep waiting. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 12 and verse 43. The Gospel of Luke chapter 12 and verse We'll go up to verse number 42, answering the question of Peter about the last parable that Christ had, been, had spoken. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in their season? Blessed is that servant whom his, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him so doing. When the Lord comes, how do you want him to find you? In white robes on the hillside waiting? Or working? He wants to find us working. He wants to find us doing. Performing the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth until he comes. Up to the very moment that we are caught away. You know, when Christ ascended back into heaven in Acts chapter 1, he was still teaching his disciples, even as he was being caught up into the air. 
And ye shall, and he, he said, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Christ was teaching until he went home to be with his father. We should be working and occupying until the Lord comes. Amen. Not giving up, not giving in, but continuing with patient endurance. The work that the Lord has given us. The farmer also doesn't get into fights with his neighbors usually. One of the marks of farmers is their willingness to be able to help each other when times get tough and things go bad. There's usually no time or energy for disputes with the neighbors on the farm anyway. See, James must have been thinking of this when he wrote there in verse number 9, Grudge not one against another. Brethren, lest ye be condemned, behold, the judge standeth before the door. Impatience with God, more often than not, will lead to impatience with God's people. And we must avoid this sin in our life. If we start using the sickle on each other, we'll totally miss the harvest altogether. We need the patience of a farmer to achieve a spiritual harvest in our life and in our church's life as well. I appreciate your time and attention. Next week, we'll look at the next picture there in verse number 10, the picture of the prophets.